gospel reading for today is taken from Daniel, the 6th chapter, verse 1 through 16. It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom. With these three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel, the satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and the satraps were tried, tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in this conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So the administrators and the satraps went to a, as a group to the king and said, may King Darius live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce a decree that everyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that, any, that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any god or human being except to you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the laws of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, and to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. Then the men as a group went as a group to King Darius and said to him, Remember, your majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no degree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, may your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. you bow with me as we pray? <clears throat> Gracious Lord, give me the words to say today uh, from your word. Let, my not, let not my words speak, but rather your words speak to our hearts today. And may you use this message to transform our hearts and lives so that we can be a little bit more like Jesus Christ today and tomorrow and in the days to come. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're continuing now in a sermon series called Old Testament Heroes, uh, where we were looking at uh, some of the characters from the Old Testament that we read about to learn more about their story, to see what they uh, have to say to us and what they speak to us from God's Word. Uh, and uh, this morning we're looking at the life of Daniel. Now, probably many of you remember the story of Daniel. If you grew up in the church and you went to Sunday school, 
Uh, you remember the story of Daniel in the lion's den. It was one of those dramatic type stories. And, and I, I, you know, it, it's funny when you read the stories or you heard the stories as a kid growing up in church, you, you didn't always get all the details that uh, you, as you read the scriptures yourself as an adult, you're like, oh, I didn't realize that was in there. I didn't realize that was in there or, or those sorts of things. I just remember as a kid, uh, 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 the, we had the felt board as a kid, you know, and that was, that was high multimedia growing up. You had the felt board, and you had the little cutouts with felt on the back of them, and they would stick that up there, and they go, here's Daniel, you know, and they had that one, and then they had the one that looked like a rock with a hole in it. This is the lion's den, you know, and then they had two or three lions they would put on, and they would tell the story of Daniel in the lion's den. Well, hopefully you're going to hear a little bit more, or already have heard a little bit more about the story, and know exactly what is going on in this particular story. Now, last week we learned that our biblical heroes aren't necessarily perfect. In fact, there's only one perfect person in the Bible, and that's, that's Jesus. Uh, the rest of the folks that we read about in the scriptures, uh, they were imperfect people. They didn't have it all together all the time. Uh, they struggled. They had challenges uh, and so forth. And this morning, uh, we're going to learn how uh, being a hero doesn't mean that you get a pass on life. You, it doesn't mean you get a pass in, in life to, in the facing of challenges. It doesn't mean you get a pass in life in facing challenges. If you're going to live heroically for God, if you're going to live and do the right things that God wants you to do and to be the person that God calls you to be, guess what? It doesn't mean that your life is going to be a bed of roses. It doesn't mean that uh, uh, it means you will face challenges. In fact, I believe that, uh, that, that there is an enemy out there that wants to subvert God and, and to, to, to do all that the enemy can to, to bring people away from God. And so I think even as we seek to live in faithfulness, that uh, our enemy, the devil, and his, his uh, uh, cohorts are out there to try to, uh, to, to work against us. Uh, and so uh, not just him, but others in the world that, that don't like Christianity, that, that think faith is a crutch. There are people out there who are working against us. And so to live for God or to live a heroic life for God uh, does not mean that we won't face challenges. And it does not mean that we won't face challengers, as such was the case with this week's hero the, who we're looking at. And that is study. Uh, Daniel, I'm sorry, it's just Daniel. Um, let's, uh, let's take just a few minutes real quick and kind of give some background on Daniel so you know kind of the setting of the stage and you know what, uh, who he was and, and where he fit into the picture. Daniel was of the tribe of Judah, which is uh, part of God's people. You know, there's northern kingdom, there's southern kingdom, Israelites, J uh, Judah, all that uh, were God's people. And, and so uh, that particular Judah was, was conquered by, uh, by the Babylonian Empire. And uh, during that time, uh, sometime around 605 B.C., Daniel, they, uh, experts believe he was probably around 15, so late, mid to late teens. And, uh, and so he was conquered, and he was one of the captives that was taken back to, to uh, 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 the kingdom of, of Babylon, which was not an uncommon practice. You see, when, when you conquered back then, uh, you conquered and you took the resources. And it wasn't just the taking of the resources of gold or food or that kind of plunder. It wasn't just taking all the, the best of the cattle or the sheep or things like that. What, what conquering countries would do, uh, tribes or empires, whatever, would do, they would take the best and the brightest from your particular tribe or kingdom and bring them back and assimilate them into their, into their society. And the reason for doing that is you're, you're taking the best and the brightest of the knowledge base and the, the skills the base. And so they take the, the folks that had the best skills. They take the folks that were the, the teachers or the professors. They take the folks that had the most knowledge that they could bring in and assimilate into their empire, into their kingdom, so that they could better benefit their, uh, their empire and knowledge base. And, and that's exactly what, uh, what, had, what had happened. The Babylonians, uh, when they did this, uh, they were very intentional about it, just as many of the countries were. Uh, they didn't just throw them in there and stick them in a jail somewhere. They wanted them to be assimilated into the culture. Uh, they wanted them not to be a good Jew anymore, or, or, or uh, they wanted them to be a, a good uh, member of the Babylonian society, a contributing member. And so they would do certain things to, uh, to, to assimilate them. First of all, they, would, uh, they took them away from their families. They took them away from everything they knew, everything they were comfortable with, uh, everything that was in their circle of, of influence. And so not only their families, but their religious uh, orders or their, their place of, of worship, they were taken away from that. And, and, and uh, 
In Daniel's case, it was uh, 700 miles, basically. He was taken away from family and friends and from his uh, religious community. The second thing they sought to do was uh, to uh, introduce a new worshiping community to them. And so uh, in Babylon, they had a pantheon of gods that they worshiped, Baal and others. And so uh, they tried to, to get them to, to no longer worship the Lord God Almighty, but to try to get them to worship uh, Baal and, and the other gods of the Babylonian uh, uh, kind of pantheon of gods. The third thing they would do is they would then change their language. So they didn't want them speaking uh, Hebrew anymore, so they had them speaking Akkadian, which was the language of the Babylonians. The fourth thing they did was they taught them from the Babylonian books of learning. And so here they are learning about science and religion and politics, all from a Babylonian perspective. They were enculturating them. They were, they were assimilating them. They were doing everything they could. And then finally, uh, what they did... Uh, to try to take away their former identity and their former culture and way of living is that they changed their names. And Daniel's name was also one of the ones that was changed. Now, Daniel in Hebrew means God is my judge. But what he became when he was brought to Babylon was Bel-Te-Shazar. Some of these words are not the easiest to pronounce. Bel-Te-Shazar. And uh, that is a name that means May Baal, who is a pagan god, May Baal preserve the king. So even his name had, had, uh, 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 had a completely different connotation. Uh, and it was meant to shape who Daniel was. They would give him this new name. Now, Daniel faced challenges and challengers while living in captivity in Babylon. But at the same time, as we read his story, this story and others, we learn that Daniel actually prospered very well in Babylon. Uh, he, he lived uh, as a man of integrity. He continued to, to, to seek after the Lord God Almighty. He continued to seek his Lord, but he also continued to seek as one, or to live as one who sought after his Lord. And so Daniel lived a life of integrity. He lived a life of character. He was, had a strong character. He was a man of, who was trustworthy. He was a man who was true. He was a man of hard work. He was dependable. He was loyal. He did his best no matter what the circumstance or what the situation. And as a result, he found favor in the eyes of the Babylonian Empire. He found favor in the lives of those that, that uh, he was captive to. Uh, he sought to be his best no matter what the circumstances were that he faced. And over time, Daniel worked his way up in the Babylonian Empire to positions of great prominence. We read about it today in, in Daniel chapter 6, how Daniel, uh, under King Belshazzar, uh, was given the third highest position. Now, there's other stories that you're invited to go read uh, in the Scriptures uh, that, that speak of Daniel's life and what led up to this, but, but because of the way he lived and the integrity he had and the godly character that he showed, he was seen as someone uh, of, of trustworthiness and truth, and so he was built up. He, he, he became higher and higher. So as you read, he was, there was the 120 satraps. Those were basically governors over providences, and, but above them were three administrators, and Daniel was one of these three. He basically controlled and led and organized and shaped one-third of the kingdom of Babylon. And he was about to get the head position over even those three. And that's when things began uh, to, to go wrong. So Daniel was one who, who distinguished himself. And we read about how this distinguished uh, nature of Daniel's life, uh, because he was living for God, uh, caught the eye of the king, who at this time was no longer King Belshazzar. It was the next king in line. It was King Darius. Listen to verse 3 of Daniel chapter 6 again. Verse 3 says this, Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him up over the whole kingdom. So as the story goes, it's almost like a soap opera. Those uh, other administrators, those other satraps who, who they were hoping to jockey for a better position because they were all about power, they were all about position, they were all about prestige, and they weren't going to get this by uh, the means that they were living. And so when they saw Daniel being lifted up, and, and, and about to be promoted, they began to get sneaky. You know, they began to wring their hands and worry and fuss, and they would get together, what are we going to do? How do we get rid of Daniel? Well, they knew they couldn't point to anything that he did as far as his responsibilities in the government. Uh, they, there was nothing. You know, every, he was the perfect candidate. 
He had no bad history. He had no, he didn't have illicit affairs going on. He, he, he didn't have where he wasn't embezzling any money. He was living as a man of integrity. And so they couldn't get him on that. And so they thought, well, gosh, let's get him a different way. Let's get him because of his faith. And so uh, they, they got together and they, they went to the king and they, and they lied to him basically because they said everybody, it's funny how people talk when they're trying to manipulate things, they, they, it's suddenly everybody and all of them, you know, everybody doesn't like this preacher. Well, okay, how many people actually don't like this, you know? Uh, it's funny how we get to always and everybody kind of thing. That's, but that's what they did. Uh, Daniel wasn't in on this, but they acted like he was. And they go to the king and say, everybody thinks that for the next 30 days they should worship you and you alone and pray to you and pray to you alone. So let's not pray to anybody else, not pray to anybody human or or any of our gods, but for the next 30 days, let's stroke your ego, king, basically is what they were doing, and uh, we're going to worship you. And the king was like, well, that that sounds pretty good. You know, he'd like to have his ego stroked, I guess. And so he agreed to this decree. It was written down. It was according to the laws and rules of governments in that time, the Persians, the Medes. And, uh, and so this whole went through. But they were waiting. Because as soon as the decree went through, those that uh, were against Daniel were waiting and listening for him because they knew exactly what he was going to do, that he was going to continually be the man of integrity that he was, but also the man of faith he was. And so they sat out of his house and they listened at his windows and they heard that three times a day he still uh, was not phased in his faith, but he continued to worship and to pray to the Lord God Almighty. So when this happened, they go back to the king and you heard what, uh, what was read for us today. They said, now king, you, uh, you said that this happens. They had thrown the lion's den and that's exactly what happens after they tattled on Daniel and the king being true to his word uh, went and threw Daniel into the lion's den but he did so not he he didn't do so without concern for Daniel and I believe that concern was genuine I believe it was more than just the fact that he saw Daniel as an effective producer uh, or or an effective employee in his uh, governmental uh, company but rather he had seen something more in Daniel listen to the words that King Darius says to Daniel Uh, right before they throw him into the lion's den. It says, The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. The king obviously didn't like what he was about to do or what he was having to do, but he had made the law and he had written it down and it was a decree. And so he must do what he did. And so sure enough, he threw Daniel into the lion's den. The king couldn't sleep all night. And then the next thing we read is it says, At first light the king got up and went down to the lion's den. He didn't sleep in that morning as if he didn't have a care in the world. He didn't wait till noon. He didn't wait until after he had his first cup of coffee or he had his big stack of pancakes. He went straight down to the lion's den and he wanted to see if Daniel was there. And what does it say he did? He called out to Daniel. Listen to Daniel chapter 6, verse 20. The king calls out to Daniel. He says, Daniel servant of the living God he doesn't just say servant of a God he says servant of the living God as your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue you from the lions now I want you to stop and think about that for a minute King Darius is a king in the Babylonian empire who worships pagan gods as a practice and yet here he is after having lived with Daniel as an important member of his, his household, if you will, coming down to the lion's den and calling forth for Daniel. Now think about that for a minute. The stone, he could see that the stone they rolled over the lion's den, which Scripture tells us was there, uh, was there. It, it hadn't been moved. And the way he knew it hadn't been moved was they sealed it with the signet ring, not only his, but all of his nobles had their rings sealed into that rock. And the way they did that, they would put wax over it, and the wax, you could see if it was broken or not, and so they would put their seal, the rings on the wax. And, and, and here they are. He sees that. He sees his ring indentation. He sees all of his nobles indentation. He knows beyond a shadow of a doubt that, that Daniel did not sneak out in the middle of the night. He also knows that Sending people to the lion's den is something kings did back then. 
And he knows why they sent people to the lion's den. It was because it was a very effective means of getting rid of people who had broken the law. So he has, he has every reason to, to believe that, that, that Daniel is dead. They don't put under effective lions in lion's dens. They don't put fat, dumb, and lazy lions in lion's den. They put hungry, ferocious lions in lion's den. Why? Because the reason they put people in lion's den is to get rid of them. And yet, he goes to the lion's den knowing that it's been sealed, knowing that Daniel's been there the entire night, knowing that the lions have been effective in what they do already, and he calls out to Daniel. If you don't realize it yet, that was an act of faith in Daniel's God, the Lord God Almighty. Obviously, Daniel's witness had had effect upon the king. Daily, he had, wit he had watched Daniel uh, work by his side. Daily, Daniel had shown the king that he was a man of integrity. integrity. Daily, Daniel had proved himself to the king to be a man of character. Daily, Daniel had shown himself to the king to be a man of faith. Daily, Daniel had lived the life of a follower of the Lord before the king. And his daily witness had planted daily seeds in the king's life. And those seeds had begun to germinate. They had begun to take root. And they began to shape and mold and have an influence on the greatest man in that kingdom, which was King Darius himself. And even knowing that not anyone had survived the lion's den previous, he called out as an act of faith. I love it. Uh, how Daniel responds to the king. He responds both respectfully and truthfully. He doesn't get mad. He's not, why did you do this to me? He says, may the king live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the, the mouths of the lions, and they hurt me not because I was innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done anything wrong to you, your majesty. The experience of, of hearing Daniel's voice call back from the lion's den was something that brought great joy to, to King Darius' life. And so now it's gone from those seeds that had been planted that were starting to germinate. Suddenly they burst forth through the soil of King Darius' heart and they bloom into full. Listen to what he says in verse 20. He says, he says, the king was overjoyed and he gave orders to lift Daniel out of the lion's den. And if and if that wasn't enough, the next two things are even more amazing. Well, the first one's a little rough. The first one, he, 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 the first thing the king does after he learns about Daniel's being delivered by God is he sends all of his accusers into the same place that he had thrown Daniel. He pulls Daniel out of the lion's den, and all of those satraps, all of those administrators, all of their family members get thrown in the lion's den. Now, I'm, I'm not uh, promoting violence or encouraging that or anything like that, but that's just something that happened, okay? It's the second thing that I want you to see. Listen to what the new decree that the king issues says. The king says in verse 26 and verse 27, I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. He doesn't say, hey, this is really great. I'm glad Baal did this. He doesn't say, hey, this is great. I'm glad this other God did this. Is, I don't, no, he says, every part of my kingdom. People must fear and reverence the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and saves. He performs signs and wonders. And in the heavens and on earth, he has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. And folks, that's amazing when you think about it. Here is the king of a pagan nation proclaiming the glory of God because one man sought to live his life daily for God. Here are the two important lessons I want you to take from this story of Daniel as our hero this morning. The first lesson is this. Daniel's circumstances didn't change who he was. Daniel had been taken from his home he had been basically kidnapped. He had been basically, they tried to brainwash him. They tried to, to shape and mold him. But even as a young man, Daniel, in the midst of that circumstances, which were great, he faced challengers and challenges. 
he didn't change who he was. He remembered who he was and whose he was in every situation. That's important for us to remember. You see, Daniel's faith was, was, uh, was not determined by his situation or his circumstance. Daniel's faith was not determined by the society in which he lived. Daniel's faith was not determined by the way others viewed things. Daniel's faith was not determined by the educational system that he was under. Daniel's faith was not determined by those he worked with on a daily basis. It was not determined by the political leaders of his day. Daniel remained a man of faith and integrity because he was a follower of Jesus Christ and he took his sorry, he was a follower of the Lord God Almighty and he took his commitment seriously. I've already extrapolated to the point that I want you to take home with this. You got that? bringing Jesus into the Old Testament. He's in there. You get the point. God calls us to live for Him daily. God calls for us to be the people that we are to be as followers of Jesus Christ, regardless of what the situation is we're facing. Regardless of what is popular in society, regardless of what is popular on your block, regardless of what Hollywood is telling you or, or what Madison Avenue is telling you, we are to be who we are to be in Jesus Christ because we are to be people of integrity in Christ. That's the first thing, integrity. The second thing kind of goes a little further with it, but it's an important lesson. We should continually seek to live for Christ and be a positive influence in the lives of everyone we come in contact with because we never know how God may use our Christian witness for good in the life of of another person. Think about Daniel's seeds that he planted with, with the king. Not only King Dan, uh, Darius, but King Belshazzar before that because he hadn't gotten to that position until King Belshazzar got him there. So obviously, he had influence on him. King Darius, the next king, had seen how good Daniel was, had seen what a man of trustworthiness he was. He knew that he could entrust him with his entire kingdom because he was a man of character, godly character. He was a man of integrity. He didn't go back on his word. He did what was right even when it was tough. He did what was right even when other people weren't going to do that. He didn't get caught up in the political games. He was the person he was called to be even in the midst of everyone else doing other things that tried to lead him astray. I love the words uh, in Daniel chapter uh, 6, verse 16 and, and, and verse 20. I, I didn't ever notice these words before I was studying it for this week, for this, this message. Uh, but it's one word that stands out, and it's that word continually. Listen to, uh, this, is what, this is what King uh, uh, Darius says to Daniel before he's thrown into the lion's den. Remember, I read this earlier. The king said to Daniel, may your God, whom you serve, what? Continually rescue you. And then, after he couldn't sleep all night, and he runs down, even before getting his first cup of coffee or his, or his pancakes, he runs down to the, uh, the lion's den. And then what does he say to, to Daniel when he calls out in verse 20? He says, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve what? Continually been able to rescue from the lion. Daniel served God in the big things, Daniel served God in the little things. Daniel was consistent in his Christian or his witness for God no matter what the situation. He was consistent continually. Now I want to go back to the very beginning of the sermon really quickly. Remember I told you there are no perfect heroes in the Bible other than Jesus Christ. Yet we are still called to live continually for God. And we still have a witness to give for Jesus Christ continually when we're doing it right and even when we're doing it wrong and what i mean by that is we're all going to fail we're all going to mess up we're all going to stumble but our christian witness can be even more powerful when we get back up when we ask for forgiveness when we admit our faults when we admit our sin and when we still turn to god in the midst of our struggle Sometimes we think, gosh, I can't be the person that, that, you know, I can't be the good Christian witness that I need to be because I'm, I'm not perfect. I mess up. Yes. But even in your messing up, you can still be a Christian witness. And when you raise your voice at your children and you said things, oh, I shouldn't have said that, you know, don't ignore that. Go to them and say, you know what? 
Dad messed up. Mom messed up. And that's still a Christian witness. Because then they see what it means to be human. They see what it means to confess a sin. They see what it means when you look at them and say, would you please forgive me for that? And then they get to participate in God's gift of forgiveness. When you're, when you're going through life, you're not going to do this perfectly. Guess what? If you will still trust in God, if you will continually turn to Him even when you mess up, that witness can be just as powerful, if not more powerful, than when you're doing everything right. So live for God continually. Live with integrity and live continually. And we can do that, not in our own strength and power, but in the strength and power that God gives us. Amen? Amen. Amen.